Hello, ladies and gentlemen, Big Daddy Top Hat here. In the late 80s, moving into the early 90s, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles franchise would captivate children's imaginations around the world, with the animated TV show, based off the comic book series, quickly becoming must-see television for an entire generation. Many kids of this era would live and breathe turtles, leading to the release of countless cash-ins on the show's popularity, from action figures, clothing ranges, live action movies, and most importantly today, video games. If you have been following my content for a while, it is likely that you have seen all of my retrospectives documenting turtles games in the arcades and on home consoles, covering the classic period of the franchise. But there are still more video games from this Turtles Golden Era for us to get through. For example, some of the trilogy of games on the Nintendo Game Boy. So join me as we look back at the second entry in the Game Boy series, explore this Konami title's impact, and discuss whether or not it is worth playing today. Were Game Boy owners delivered a worthy dose of Turtles fun? Let's find out. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the overlooked story of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, Back from the sewers. Yeah! For this riveting upload, I want to take you all back to the radical, tubular year of 1991. Our amphibious hero's run of success was continuing, with enough Turtles content to tantalise even the most die-hard fans' taste buds. As aside from the TV show that regularly had new episodes airing, the second live-action movie named Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2 The Secret of the Ooze would hit theatres as well. On top of all of this, fans were treated to multiple new video games, featuring our favourite group of vigilantes. Four new games in fact, and that is without counting all of the ridiculous handheld electronic instalments that were created that year too. Amongst these games, the awesome foursome had returned to the arcades, giving us Turtles in Time, arguably the greatest Ninja Turtles game ever. They were back on the Nintendo Entertainment System with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3 The Manhattan Project, a two-player beat-em-up that was produced exclusively for the hardware. And the Turtles even had their own exclusive DOS game, known as Manhattan Missions, which perhaps deserves its own exploratory video down the line. But today, as mentioned earlier, our focus is on a further game released in 1991. Back from the sewers, the second game released on the Nintendo Game Boy hardware. As of 1991, Nintendo's 8-bit monochrome system was still a fairly new handheld, existing on the market for only two years thus far. But thanks to its cheap price point and appealing early releases, the Game Boy had quickly carved a niche out for itself as a must-own piece of simple technology. The Game Boy's early sales success would promptly lead to the 1990 release of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Fall of the Foot Clan, a Konami game we have covered on here in the past that was in many ways very impressive for its time. Fall of the Foot Clan is a simple pick up and play platforming game where players must guide the turtles through five simplistic stages. But the game did have some particularly impressive features, such as great atmospheric music from legendary Symphony of the Night composer Michiru Yamani. But most standout of all though was this installment's graphics, which were perfect for the Game Boy. What I mean by this is that the sprites appear large on the screen. While this may sound like a simple, obvious feature that should be included in games on a small monochrome device, Fall of the Foot Clan was one of the first to actually do this, with the likes of Super Mario Land offering tiny blurry sprites in comparison, with Nintendo themselves failing to recognise this issue until the release of Super Mario Land 2 Six Golden Coins. Konami with their Turtles games on the Game Boy though, got the sprite sizes right the first time around. After the moderate success of Fall of the Foot Clan, it would be less than one year until the game's sequel would arrive. Back from the sewers, that would first arrive in November of 1991, would arrive on the market with graphical presentation that would somehow manage to top that of what was already found in the first Game Boy game offering an experience that features even more detailed sprite work and some great animation to boot. Interestingly, this feat was achieved by a completely different team to that of the people who worked on Fall of the Foot Clan. Back from the sewers was led by Hiroyuki Fukui, a man with a wealth of experience who had worked as a main programmer on both the 1987 Metal Gear game along with Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake. In fact, he even worked in collaboration with Hideo Kojima as a main programmer for the legendary Snatcher. 
but you will be even more impressed when you learn of who the design and artist was who worked on this ridiculously smooth looking early 8-bit monochrome title. The man responsible for these job roles within the creation of Back From The Sewers was none other than Sakurai, the great man behind the success of Nintendo's Super Smash Bros. series. So knowing this, it is not surprising whatsoever that this game looks as good as it does. In the music department, we had Yuko Kurahashi and Tsuyoshi Sikito, composers who had previously created the score for SD Snatcher and Solid Snake. So a more than capable team was involved with this Game Boy project. So, with this all-star cast of staff assembled, let's take a deeper look at what they created. The game's introductory sequence mimics the television show intro before players are whisked off to a Turtles player select screen, where gamers can choose which of the four they want to play as. Aside from the weapons, due to the game's monochrome display, the four look identical. In terms of abilities in combat, the four do differ, offering different speeds and reach depending on which turtle you choose, so there is that. Act 1 of the game appears to take place in the sewers, which indicates that perhaps the game was titled wrong and that it simply should have been called Back to the Sewers rather than Back from the Sewers, but I guess we do progress out of the drainage network pretty quickly to the street level above. With regards to the gameplay on display, it's pretty much identical to the first Turtles Game Boy game at first, but as you will be able to see, presentation has been brought up a notch throughout with more detailed sprites and backgrounds aplenty, added to the game's aesthetic appeal massively. The whole thing certainly feels even closer to the animated series than with the previous effort. Players soon descend back into the sewers where all of this extra attention to detail can be further witnessed, with even an animation sequence of a foot soldier detonating a bomb leaving a massive hole in the floor that a turtle must cross by holding onto an exploding pipe. Foot soldiers down here even emerge from the foreground and background, giving this game a greater sense of depth than many on the platform. Pair this with the appropriately composed music, a sense of urgency is delivered as enemies multiply from all angles. It's impressive stuff. Returning to the surface, the background continues to come into play, with a stage boss Rocksteady coming crashing through the building wall behind him. Players must defeat Rocksteady by repeatedly hitting him, but also dodging the objects that the foot soldiers are dropping from the windows above. Moving on to stage 2, surprisingly gameplay is mixed up from what we have previously experienced, offering gamers a skateboarding section that plays much like those found in the Turtles arcade games. This auto-scrolling part of the game offers more directional movement than simply being able to move from right to left and the smooth auto-scrolling is very impressive for the Game Boy, much like what else can be found within the game. After dealing with many enemies, it all eventually comes to a grinding halt when players encounter Bebop, who players must take on in a more free-moving fashion than with Rocksteady, fighting him like a boss in a classic beat-em-up. The game also features bonus stages where players must collect pizza in order to regain health, but there is not really much else to say about these. However, I guess it is worth noting that these stages are only accessible if you have all four turtles remaining. If one of them loses all of their health, a bonus stage occurs giving you a chance to earn them back. Moving into Act 3, it seems that the turtles arrive in some sort of construction site where gamers can choose to platform on multiple levels. There are falling buckets to avoid and familiar enemies to take out, along with the odd new one too. It is all very faithful to the television source material. Gamers eventually enter a lift which leads to a literal beat em up lift section, which is a fun change of pace from the flat platforming that the game mostly offers. The next part of the stage allows turtles to ascend and descend from buildings that are under construction, offering gamers a further layer of freedom and exploration than what we generally have come to know when we played Fall of the Foot Clan previously in the series. A boss battle eventually occurs against Krang, who is riding a walker, another familiar opponent who acts as one of the primary antagonists in the TV program. Defeating him leads to destroying his walker before progressing to the next stage of the game. Act 4 opens up in a cave with players evading Raid Roth and Lost Ark style boulders that come hurtling towards the players, before doing the same thing at an even brisker pace down the slope. Gamers will instantly notice music often changing to match the pace of play, a cool touch that helps to continue to keep this game immersive. The level of detail on display continues to be very impressive throughout. 
There are geezers and falling boulders as players traverse the cavern, even moving through mysterious holes in the walls that keep connecting the area to sewage waterways. After defeating the mid-stage boss and eventually making it back above ground, you discover a piece of drilling equipment that has made the holes in the walls, which appears that it was piloted by Shredder, who acts as the area's last opponent. He can perform kicks and shoot projectiles, but defeating him leads to his escape. At 5, see the turtles in the sky moving from airborne platform to airborne platform, ascending upwards to the end of the stage rather than simply from left to right like in many others. Completing this section that further diversifies the game leads to a boss fight against Baxter Stockman, before beginning to move through a set of rooms that contain beat em up style gameplay. The stage closes out with another familiar boss battle against another enemy from the television show before finally rescuing April O'Neil. The final act, Act 6, is a sewer surfing section containing many obstacles that the turtles must avoid. I am sure if the Game Boy was capable of it, the turtles would be shouting, My toe, my toe! Players eventually reach and enter a large vehicle, which I think is meant to be the Technodrome, a familiar setting where many turtles games culminate. This is the Bowser's castle of the Turtles universe after all. As a final stage, it delivers pretty much what gamers would expect, a long gauntlet that utilises all of the skills that gamers have developed throughout the rest of the playthrough. This is by far the longest stage in the game, with moving conveyor belts, previous bosses resurfacing, lift sections and more. In one of these boss fights, it occurs against Shredder himself, this time in his super form. Defeating him, you progress deeper into the Technodrome. The true final boss fight in this one though takes place against an exosuit wearing Krang, who defeating brings down the Technodrome completely, leaving the Game Boy to blast out the words Carabunga. I guess the Game Boy probably could have said my toe, my toe. All in all, it has to be said, Back From The Sewers is a very impressive Game Boy game for 1991, which built on the already impressive Fall of the Foot Clown from 1990 delivering an 8-bit Turtles experience that was certainly a well above average game on the platform. Looking around the internet, I am not the only one impressed with what was achieved with this one either. The leftover culture review would add that outside of creating a really decent Game Boy game, Konami took that extra step to make it memorable. One of the best. Back From The Sewers is worth checking out for any fan of the classic Ninja Turtle cartoon. It manages to cram a lot of characters, stages and action into one small cartridge. Hardcore Gaming 101 would build on the conversation, commenting, It is a game that looks at all of the elements that worked in the previous games, meshes them together and further builds upon those ideas to craft a very enjoyable, neatly sized game with lasting appeal and tons of authentic charm from what it is based on. Rather than trying to do a lot of new things that do not stick, it rather just focuses on the things that do work, and the result is one of the all-time best Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles games available. It is very clear that a lot of love was put into this handheld classic, and if anything, it does not quite receive the praise today that it perhaps deserves. I'd argue a strong case for it to be a game that all Game Boy owners should try to add to their collection. It really is that good. As for the Turtles on the original Game Boy, we have one more instalment in the trilogy left to look at, but that is obviously a topic that we shall be tackling in a future episode of this series. But to tide you over in the meantime, feel free to check out my movie length upload that covers every arcade and home console released Turtles game from the classic era. Or why not check out my video covering the ultimate Turtles fan project known as Rescue Palooza. On my channel, there is plenty of Turtles goodness to tide you over until we receive the brand new instalment in the series known as Shredder's Revenge at some point soon. So I hope you enjoyed digging through my backlog. Until then. If you're a long time viewer and you enjoy my storytelling style, then I would adore it if you could subscribe to my new YouTube channel, Top Pat Wrestling Man, where we look at obtuse elements of wrestling history, such as Kai and Tai, pro wrestling's most evil tag team, who we spotlighted last week. Indeed. Finally, I would like to give a warm thank you to everyone who backed this channel on Patreon, helping me work on content like this full time in the first place. 
So special shout outs go out to Sebastian Velez, a murder of crows, Carl Johnson, Heo Paulo Lopez, Nostalgia Collector, Ben Haradine, Corey Armash Sr., Capcom vs SNK, BXL Gotham, Rowan Dinched, Evan Border, Philip Manth, Azor Rolakai, Keith Ferguson, Joaquin Varela, Michael Cullix, Ego, Jordan Durant, Angel Light 85, Ian Boyle, Nick Daniels, Princess Zana, Daniel Daly, Computer Man, House of a Ted, Gary Pinkett, ECU Professor, Kid Anime, Justin Wang, Aaron McNamara, Hermes Gonzalez, Instant Gratification Monkey, Man Channel, James Bishop, JB, Michael Hall, Wesley Sang, He, Felatio, Langston Miller, New, Brian Barry, Sarah Powell, Vlamic, Renee, Marvin Araliga, Chris Cool, TOG Driver, Adrian Hannington, Bernard NG, Richard G. Stewart, Dan Van Damick, Louis Viant, John Bates, David Bow, Chris Fisk, Michael Bruno, Rick67, Antonio Rodriguez, Craig Jenkins, Retroverse.com, Casey Wright, Synth Spaces, Zai, Andrew Bazanski, Alex Summers, Gunther Hendricks, and everybody else who watches and supports this channel. Thank you so, so much. Yeah. Cheerio.